how can one compare a classical uh, musician with a professional speed skater? Uh, and that's something uh, which I'm going to talk about with Bjorn Nijnhaus. He is a former professional speed skater and now he's doing a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Groningen. And uh, we got in touch with him through his support for a classical musician who's trying to improve his skills for, I think, Bach or Beethoven. I'm not sure, but it's something Bjorn will talk about. So Bjorn, welcome at, uh, at uh, the Yakayima TV's uh, talk. Um, Thank you very much. Let's start with that project and maybe also add something on your background and then we go there from go further on your research uh, Field, so please go ahead about the classical musician Thank you. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question uh, I would say the connection for me between a professional athlete and a professional musician the connection was neuroscience so mm -hmm. My education in neuroscience is now going on for about 10 years has been extremely elusive in uh, allowing me to connect these two fields in a way that is meaningful. And importantly, and something I think that we'll definitely get into as far as this discussion is concerned, uh, connect them in ways that is deeply rooted in quantitative and empirical research as opposed to psychological constructs and abstract ideas that we love to to talk about and trade in uh, but often are severely lacking in some sort of uh, evidence or uh, uh, empirical grounding so neuroscience was for me a lodestone it was an anchor that allowed me to start to say things about what i think professional musicians can do to improve that that I believe uh, uh, can stand the test of scrutiny and the very great scrutiny of the extremely talented, uh, goal-oriented, hardworking professional musicians that I work with. So, the, in, in, but in essence, you say it's it's the brains where there is the the similarity. Uh, is, is that correct? Or yeah, you're changing your brain. Yeah. Now, the thing is. Uh, I mean, what we're talking about here at the highest level when it comes to performance related, specifically related to physical movement, uh, we're, we're talking about changing our nervous system, refining our nervous system in a way that allows us to produce extremely complex and intricate movements at a very, very high level. Mm -hmm. Now that sentence, that works for a speed skater and it also works uh, for a professional musician and that was one of the realizations that got me on this track some of the foremost researchers in the field of neuroscience and music some of them refer to musicians as small muscle athletes yeah and that makes a lot of sense yeah uh, <clears throat> and made a lot of sense uh, uh, to me so that was a that was essentially the launching off point so and then in essence you'll help this musician and I understand you're also working with the uh, a music school or something where, where they're pop musicians you help them using their brains to imp and with improvement in in in, 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 um, uh, in, in to improve their ability to play the music that's the, and and that use you and you use your let's say background also as a professional speed skater so yeah i work with the conservative conservatory of amsterdam both in the classical department principally actually in the classical department but also occasionally in the in the pop department mm -hmm. uh you know the, the the truth of the matter is that uh what we're talking about here is practiced movements that have been worked on with just an extreme amount of attention and time and investment for years and years and years, mm -hmm. oftentimes decades. And what happens in a situation like that is a musician or uh, for example, a speed skater, they'll often have society, have, they'll, society will often have a lot of expectations for what it is that makes them great, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, with a professional musician, it's off, a professional athlete, it's often what they eat, how they like what they train like what sort of weight trainings they do what sort of uh what what sort of uh, 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 uh schedule they have with uh, uh with regard to 
you know, with taking vitamins and on all these things. It's, it's often about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. But, but the, the real way in which professional athletes make change is actually in how they do stuff. So it's, it's the order of operations. It's the, it's the meta structure of different activities that they're involved in and how they're ordered together that creates a lot of, a lot of the advantage for them at a higher level. And the reason for that is, is, is that is actually optimizing your nervous system. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's optimizing your nervous system because uh, uh, to a great extent, your nervous system is designed as a prediction machine, right? And mm-hmm. that's, that's the reason why neural networks are often good predictors, right? They're based on a similar infrastructure yeah. to, to, to how our nervous system works. It, our nervous system is, is, a, is a prediction classification algorithm at the highest level, right? Yeah. But the interesting thing about this uh, prediction classification algorithm and the way that it learns is it starts to create expectation. Right. Yeah. And so if, if you begin to engage in a very, very uh, 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 stable rhythm of activities, your nervous system will begin to expect these things. Right. And so and so uh, what professional athletes have managed to do, what they've managed to harness is a series of behaviors in a particular order that optimize the nervous system's ability to expect certain uh, uh, high-level, high-focused stimuli to that extremely well-practiced task. Okay. So here's what you're doing. You're You're getting ready to do your speed skating training. But, 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 you know, your, your nervous system has expected to train at this particular moment because you have created that rhythm for your nervous system to do so. Mm-hmm. So it is it, all the hormones and all the neurochemistry that need to be in place to make this sensitive period, this critical period in the day, the most neuroplastic and the most effective period. That's all there, right? Yeah. That's, that's ready to go. Yeah. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you're talking about professional musicians or like a professional juggler or, you know, uh, 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 a professional Morse code typer, maybe in the 1920s, whatever you're talking about, we're talking about a highly specific physical skill practice at an extremely high level where the prediction algorithms that are running your nervous system are almost always right. You know what I mean? The, the, The classifier has almost a hundred percent success rate Mm -hmm. with the prediction of not only on the macro scale, when you're going to practice what has to happen during that period when you get engaged and involved, but also specifically with the, with the physical movements of, 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 of one movement flowing into the next, these, these, these predictive algorithms are extremely, uh, are extremely effective. And extremely successful, and so and so the, the the way that this works from a from a neurocognitive level and 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 from a from, from you know a theory of neuroscience, whether we're talking about sports or whether we're talking about music, it's it's quite it's quite similar. And 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 so these these tricks that these athletes have figured out over decades of trial and error actually have solid grounding in in our neurocognition. Yeah. There's a period at 10 o'clock in the morning and a four o'clock in the afternoon when your adrenaline, your norepinephrine, uh, as it is sometimes called, same thing, adrenaline and epinephrine. If you take anything from this talk, it can be that. Uh, (laughs) Adrenaline uh, slash epinephrine is high, right? You have um, you have high cortisol levels that are actually boosting the uh, uh, the the uh, uh, the memory systems, the, res- the the relationship between your hippocampus, your limbic system, and your frontal cortex. All these things are are, are at high levels mm. around 10, 11 in the morning, and this is due to the circadian rhythm. This is due to your diurnal rhythms. You can't be that sharp if you have so much melatonin in your system. Mm. Now, melatonin peaks at four o'clock in the in the morning, right when you're supposed to be asleep. Adrenaline peaks at 11 and four in the afternoon. Now, now, this is when you should be practicing, and it's these sensitive periods on a macro level that you can engage in order to be more effective with your nervous system. Now, that's on a macro level, but then on a microscopic level of like during that practice itself, when are you focused? Like when do these sensitive periods exist mm-hmm. for really, really producing 
a, a, a stimulus that is going to have a lasting effect on your nervous system in a way that when you're sleeping and your uh, 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 and your um, the emergent complexity of your brain is busy recalibrating its neural networks for a, to be a better classification system, right? While this is happening, uh, it's going to be going back to those moments of highest salience in the day. And it turns out that those moments of highest salience in the day are very small moments. They're very small windows of opportunity, critical periods where you can create these changes. Now, if you, if you combine these critical periods with extreme high focus at the right moment and you time your and structure your life around uh, 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 this, these moments, you're going to have a better result. And that's what professional athletes have been doing for ages. And that's what musicians had no idea about. So that's, in essence, that's what you're, let's say, proposing and, and, and training, uh, helping to train or improving the musicians to, to, to follow this, let's say, route? I'm pulling the curtain back behind some of the neurocognition research and some of the neuroscience research that is, the, that, that, uh, that is starting to discover uh, some of these things that professional sports has known uh, for for quite some time. I'm 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 letting you in on on some on some of the uh, on some of the information behind the approaches mm. that seem to work so well, both in sports and also should be applied to professional music. If it wasn't, you know, for all the the, the well, the cultural biases play an important role there. You know, yeah. a lot of things play an important role there. But but now you you you've given the example of a speed skater, uh, a professional speed skater, and a professional musician, particularly uh, classical music. Now both are have a very let's say I would uh, and and I'm sorry I'm saying so, but I think it's true. It's a sort of repetitive movements. It's it's all yes. the same. Now, if I'm a jazz musician, professional jazz musician. Um, then I have to improvise constantly because they're changing, etc. And obviously, and the, so is there a parallel between a jazz musician and, let's say, a, a soccer player, football player, or, or, or a hockey player, or something? Is that is there also a, a combination to make a possibility to make a combination there? Well, well, there is, right? Sure, mm -hmm. there is. But you know, if there's one thing I've learned, mm -hmm. it's if there's one thing my scientific training has given me, it's the power to admit freely and often that I have no idea, <laughs> right? There is something incredibly freeing, liberating about this process because whatever I, well, people who are in this field of consultancy and, and, and coaching who do not have any scientific training, I constantly see them. So, so often I, I, I hear what seems to me to be an attempt to answer a question yeah. without really knowing, right? The reason I chose classical music is because it's such an interesting, because it's such an, a, 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 an interesting allegory for professional sports in so many ways from an activity, from a behavior standpoint, mm. the, the repetition, the focus of the concentration, but even there, there's big differences, right? There's huge differences between those two, but it was my understanding, at least those differences are not big enough that they can, that they, that they can have too much of a negative effect on, on my approach. Right. So, 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 you know, for a soccer player and a jazz musician, for example, they might relate more to each other in the sense that they have to be more improvisational and more creative in their mm. approach mm. and how that improvisation and how that creativity influences the kind of rigid structures that I create in order to improve technique. There's a lot of questions there and I okay, don't have so all the yeah. answers. That's your next PhD or another PhD. <laughs> <laughs> well, well that's, it's, it's, it's tricky, right? It's really tricky. I, mm. and so, you know, uh, people will often say like, okay, so like, how can we apply this to business? Right. That's yeah. thing that a lot yeah. of people often talk about. And I, I often just, you know, throw my hands up and say, well, I mean, this is a, this is a question that is beyond the purview of our, of our current understanding of the relationship between, between creative thinking and between, you know, highly complex uh, uh, behavioral systems that are extremely diverse in what the demands are, right? Yeah. I mean, we perceive the demands of a professional athlete to be quite diverse, but the truth is I can tell you from first-hand experience 
there's only a couple things that we got to do right. We can do a lot of other things wrong, but there's a few things we got to do right yeah. to stay on the top. Yeah, and uh, and and that's actually also quite true for uh, for a classical musician. Although in classical music, of course, the creative side of this, the artistic side of this, the expressive side of this, uh, also the, uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 incredibly challenging, uh, the incredibly challenging uh, dual process activity of sight reading while also being creative at the same time if you're if if, if you're reading uh, uh, music while playing mm -hmm. uh, and that's not even to mention how complex this becomes when you have to when you have to function within a larger group as an orchestra yeah uh, all of these variables are things that uh, right. terrify me a little bit from the standpoint of, of, of saying anything meaningful about them yeah so there is a lot to be uh, a lot to be done there, uh, and it's uh, I think it even seems to be a, a, a greenfield area where a lot of research can be done uh, for for musicians, professional sports, but and and as I said, also the more improvisation related stuff. So well, yeah. thank thank you very much for this brief uh, explanation about uh, uh, the relation between uh, speed skating and classical music, so to speak. Uh, I always end this, this, this interview, this, this talk with a personal question and that is something to do, what is your favorite music or, uh, or country or uh, food or whatever, uh, so that we know a bit also about the person behind the professional. So can you share that with us? Well, so I'll tell you this, um, my favorite food is, is in this day and age becoming increasingly more problematic uh, by the month. Uh, and that is, that is, uh, a, a, a triple a, uh, triple a black Angus, Alberta beef from where I come from originally in, yeah. in Canada. I'm, yeah. I, re I grew up on the foothills of the Rocky mountains Yeah. and, um, and, uh, honestly it's, it's, it's of course with the current push for sustainability and the impending, uh, uh, slow moving nightmare of climate change slowly overtaking us. I find myself eating a lot less steak, but maybe enjoy, hopefully enjoying it a lot more. Uh, I just spent a month in, uh, in, 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 in Canada. I'm a dual citizen. So I was able to, to make it over to our property there in Canada. And I was lucky enough that, uh, uh while we were there and I was indeed <laughs> preparing steak on the barbecue uh, a bear a, a mother bear and her two cubs actually uh, uh sauntered right up to the uh, balcony of our of our house in canada um i think they were hypnotized by the smell of the meat so yeah, i actually I imagine, yes <laughs> yes i actually had to ha had to get out our farm rifle and and, and shoot it at, into the air to scare them away yeah uh and uh seeing as i live in one of the most densely populated countries in the world yeah. in a metropolitan area um that of course every time that happens it's a very surreal experience okay, okay. well well thank you very much for sharing your professional activities and also your your personal let's say passion and uh, i look forward to hear more about your let's say your further uh, endeavors in your research project so thank you very much thank you